Welcome everyone to our chapter book story time here at the Caribou Public Library today. I'm Miss Erin and we are going to be starting a new book called A Bear Called Paddington by Michael Bond. Um, this was written in 1958 and um, I'm excited to read this again. Maybe some of you have seen a movie called Paddington Bear or A Bear Called Paddington. I'm not sure what the title is of the most recent version, but this is the book that has eight chapters and a postscript. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Here's a picture of Paddington wearing a hat with a tag on it hanging there and his suitcase. All right, so chapter one is called, Please Look After This Bear. And here he is sitting on his suitcase. <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Brown first met Paddington on a railway platform. In fact, that was how he came to have such an unusual name for a bear, for Paddington was the name of the station. The Browns were there to meet their daughter, Judy, who was coming home from school for the holidays. It was a warm summer day and the station was crowded with people on their way to the seaside. Trains were humming, loudspeakers blaring, porters rushing about shouting at one another, and altogether there was so much noise that Mr. Brown, who saw him first, had to tell his wife several times before she even understood. A bear in Paddington Station? Mrs. Brown looked at her husband in amazement. Don't be silly, Henry. There can be. Mr. Brown adjusted his glasses. But there is, he insisted. I distinctly saw it over there near the bicycle rack. It was wearing a funny kind of hat. Without waiting for a reply, he caught hold of his wife's arm and pushed her through the crowd round a trolley laden with chocolate and cups of tea, past a bookstall, and through a gap in a pile of suitcases towards the lost property office. There you are, he announced triumphantly, pointing toward a dark corner. I told you so. Mrs. Brown followed the direction of his arm and dimly made out a small furry object in the shadows. It seemed to be sitting on some kind of suitcase, and around its neck there was a label with some writing on it. The suitcase was old and battered, and on the side in large letters were the words, Wanted on Voyage. Mrs. Brown clutched at her husband. Why, Henry, she exclaimed, I believe you were right after all. It is a bear. She peered at it more closely. It seemed a very unusual kind of bear. It was brown in color, a rather dirty brown, and it was wearing a most odd looking hat with a wide brim, just as Mr. Brown had said. From beneath the brim, two large round eyes stared back at her. Seeing that something was expected of it, the bear stood up and politely raised its hat, revealing two black ears. Good afternoon, it said in a small, clear voice. Uh, good afternoon, replied Mr. Brown doubtfully. There was a moment of silence. The bear looked at them inquiringly. Can I help you? Mr. Brown looked rather embarrassed. Well, no, er, as a matter of fact, we were wondering if we could help you. Mrs. Brown bent down. You're a very small bear, she said. The bear puffed out its chest. I'm a very rare sort of bear, he replied importantly. There aren't many, left, many of us left where I come from. And where is that? asked Mrs. Brown. The bear looked round carefully before replying. Darkest Peru. I'm not really supposed to be here after all. I'm a stowaway. A stowaway? Mr. Brown lowered his voice and looked anxiously over his shoulder. He almost expected to see a policeman standing behind him with a notebook and pencil taking everything down. Yes, said the bear. I emigrated, you know. A sad expression came into its eyes. I used to live with my Aunt Lucy in Peru, but she had to go into a home for retired bears. You don't mean to say you've come all the way from South America by yourself, exclaimed Mrs. Brown. The bear nodded. Aunt Lucy always said she wanted me to emigrate when I was old enough. That's why she taught me to speak English. But whatever did you do for food? asked Mr. Brown. You must be starving. Bending down, the bear unlocked the suitcase with a small key which it also had round its neck, and brought out an almost empty glass jar. I ate marmalade, he said, rather proudly. Bears like marmalade, 
and I lived in a lifeboat. But what are you going to do now? said Mr. Brown. You can't just sit in Paddington Station waiting for something to happen. Oh, I shall be all right, I expect. The bear went down to do its to do up its case again. As he did so, Mrs. Brown caught a glimpse of the writing on the label. It said simply, please look after this bear. Thank you. She turned appealingly to her husband. Oh, Henry, what shall we do? We can't just leave him here. There's no knowing what might happen to him. London's such a big place when you've nowhere to go. Can't he come and stay with us for a few days? Mr. Brown hesitated, but Mary dear, we can't take him, not just like that. After all, after all what? Mrs. Brown's voice had a firm note to it. She looked down at the bear. He is rather sweet, and he'd be such company for Jonathan and Judy, even if it's only for a little while. They'd never forgive us if they knew we'd left him here. It all seems highly irregular, said Mr. Brown doubtfully. I'm sure there's a law about it. He bent down. Would you like to come and stay with us? He asked. That is, he added hastily, not wishing to offend the bear, if you've nothing else planned. The bear jumped with his hat and his hat nearly fell off with excitement. Oh, yes, please. I should like that very much. I've nowhere to go and everyone seems in such a hurry. Well, it's settled then, said Mrs. Brown before her husband could change his mind. And you ha can have marmalade for breakfast every morning. And she tried hard to think of something else that bears might like. Every morning? The bear looked as if it could hardly believe its ears. I only had it on special occasions at home. Marmalade's very expensive in darkest Peru. Then you shall have it every morning, starting tomorrow, continued Mrs. Brown, and honey on Sunday. A worried expression came over the bear's face. Will it cost very much? He added. You see, I haven't very much money. Of course not. We wouldn't dream of charging you anything. We shall expect you to be one of the family, shan't we, Henry? Mrs. Brown looked at her husband for support. Of course, said Mr. Brown. By the way, he added, if you are coming with us, you'd better know our names. This is Mrs. Brown and I'm Mr. Brown. The bear raised his hat politely twice. I haven't really got a name, he said, only a Peruvian one, which no one can understand. Then we'd better give you an English one, said Mrs. Brown. It'll make things much easier. She looked around the station for inspiration. It ought to be something special she said thoughtfully. As she spoke, an engine standing on one of the platforms, an engine standing in one of the platforms gave a loud wail and a train began to move. You know, oh, I know what, she exclaimed. I found you in Paddington Station, so we'll call you Paddington. Paddington, the bear repeated it several times to make sure. It seems a very long name. Quite distinguished, said Mr. Brown. Yes, I like Paddington as a name. Paddington it shall be. Mrs. Brown stood up. Good, now, Paddington, I have to meet our little daughter, Judy, off the train. She's coming home from school. I'm sure you must be thirsty after your long journey, so you go along to the buffet with Mr. Brown. He'll buy you a nice cup of tea. Paddington licked his lips. Mm, I'm very thirsty, he said. Seawater makes you thirsty. He picked up his suitcase, pulled his hat down firmly over his head, and waved a paw politely in the direction of the buffet. After you, Mr. Brown, er, thank you, Paddington, said Mr. Brown. Now, Henry, look after him, Mrs. Brown called after them. And for goodness sake, when you get a moment, take the label off his neck. It makes him look like a parcel. I'm sure he'll get put in the luggage van or something if a porter sees him. The buffet was crowded when they entered, but Mr. Brown managed to find a table for two in a corner. By standing on a chair, Paddington could just rest his paws comfortably on the glass top. He looked around with interest while Mr. Brown went to fetch the tea. The sight of everyone eating reminded him of how hungry he felt. There was a half-eaten bun on the table, but just as he reached out his paw, a waitress came up and swept it into a pan. You don't want that, dearie, she said, giving him a friendly pat. You don't know where it's been. Paddington felt so empty he didn't really mind where it had been, but he was much too polite to say anything. Well, Paddington, said Mr. Brown, as he placed two steaming cups of tea on the table and a plate piled high with cakes. How's that to be going on with? Paddington's eyes glistened. It's very nice, thank you, he exclaimed, eyeing the tea doubtfully, but it's rather hard drinking out of a cup. 
I usually get my head stuck or else my hat falls in and makes it taste nasty. Mr. Brown hesitated. Then you'd better give your hat to me. I'll pour the tea into a saucer for you. It's not really done in the best circles, but I'm sure no one will mind just this once. Paddington removed his hat and laid it carefully on the table while Mr. Brown poured out the tea. He looked hungrily at the cakes, in particular at a large cream and jam one, which Mr. Brown placed on a plate in front of him. There you are, Paddington, he said. I'm sorry you haven't any marmalade ones, but they were the best I could get. I'm glad I emigrated, said Paddington, as he reached out a paw and pulled a plate nearer. Do you think anyone would mind if I stood on the table to eat? Before Mr. Brown could answer, he'd climbed up and placed his right paw firmly on the bun. It was a very large bun, the biggest and stickiest Mr. Brown had been able to find. And in a matter of moments, <clears throat> most of the inside found its way onto Paddington's whiskers. People started to nudge each other and began staring in their direction. Mr. Brown wished that he had chosen a plain, ordinary bun, but he wasn't very experienced in the way of bears. How about a picture of Paddington here? Getting kind of sticky. <laughs> <clears throat> he stirred the tea and looked out the window, pretending he had tea with a bear at Paddington Station every day of his life. Henry, the sound of his voice, of his wife's voice, brought him back to earth with a start. Henry, whatever are you doing to that poor bear? Look at him. He's covered all over with cream and jam. Mr. Brown jumped up in confusion. He seemed rather hungry, he answered lamely. Mrs. Brown turned to her daughter. This is what happens when I leave your father alone for five minutes. Judy clapped her hands excitedly. Oh, Daddy, is he really going to stay with us? If he does, said Mrs. Brown, I can see someone other than your father will have to look after him. Just look at the mess he's in. Paddington, who all this time had been too interested in his bun to worry about what was going on, suddenly became aware that people were talking about him. He looked up to see that Mrs. Brown had been joined by a little girl with laughing blue eyes and long fair hair. He jumped up, meaning to raise his hat, and in haste slipped on a patch of strawberry jam, which somehow or other had found its way onto the glass tabletop. For a brief moment, he had a dizzy impression of everything and everyone being upside down. He waved his paws wildly in the air, and then, before anyone could catch him, he somersaulted backwards and landed with a splash in his saucer of tea. He jumped up even quicker than he had sat down, because the tea was very, still very hot and promptly stepped into Mr. Brown's cup. Oh no, here he is, falling over himself. <laughs> Judy threw back her head and laughed until the tears rolled down her face. Oh, mummy, isn't he funny, she cried. Paddington, who didn't think it at all funny, stood for a moment with one foot on the table and the other in Mr. Brown's tea. There were large patches of white cream all over his face. <clears throat> oh dear. And on his left ear, there was a lump of strawberry jam. You wouldn't think, said Mrs. Brown, that anyone could get in such state with just one bun. Mr. Brown coughed. He had just caught the stern eye of a waitress on the other side of the counter. Perhaps, he said, we'd better go. I'll see if I can find a taxi. He picked up Judy's belongings and hurried outside. Paddington stepped ginger gingerly off the table and, with a last look at the sticky remains of his bun, climbed down onto the floor. Judy took one of his paws. Come along, Paddington. We'll take you home and you can have a nice hot bath. Then you can tell me all about South America. I'm sure you must have had lots of wonderful adventures. I have, said Paddington earnestly. Lots. Things are always happening to me. I'm that sort of bear. When they came out of the buffet, Mr. Brown had already found a taxi, and he waved them across. The driver looked hard at Paddington, and then at the inside of his nice, clean taxi. Bears is extra, he said gruffly. Sticky bears is twice as much, again. He can't help being sticky, driver, said Mr. Brown. He's just had a nasty accident. The driver hesitated. All right, up in, but never mind, or mind, none of it comes off on me interior. I only cleaned it out this morning. The Browns trooped obediently into the back of the taxi. Mr. and Mrs. Brown and Judy sat in the back, while Paddington stood on a tip-up seat behind the driver so that he could see out the window. 
The sun was shining as they drove out of the station, and after the gloom and the noise, everything seemed bright and cheerful. They swept past a group of people at a bus stop, and Paddington waved. Several people stared, and one man raised his hat in return. It was all very friendly. After weeks of sitting alone in a lifeboat, there was much to see. There were people and cars and big red buses everywhere. It wasn't a bit like darkest Peru. Paddington kept one eye out the window in case he missed anything. With his other eye, he carefully examined Mr. and Mrs. Brown and Judy. Mr. Brown was fat and jolly, with a big mustache and glasses, while Mrs. Brown, who was also rather plump, looked like a large edition of Judy. Paddington had just decided that he was going to like staying with the Browns when the glass window behind the driver shot back and a gruff voice said, where'd you say you wanted to go? Mr. Brown leaned forward. Number 32, Windsor Gardens. The driver cupped his ear with one hand. Can't hear you, he shouted. Paddington tapped him on the shoulder. Number 32, Windsor Gardens, he repeated. The taxi driver jumped at the sound of Paddington's voice and narrowly missed hitting a bus. He looked down at his shoulder and glared. Cream, he said bitterly, all over me new coat. Judy giggled and Mr. and Mrs. Brown exchanged glances. Mr. Brown peered at the meter. He half expected to see a sign go up saying that they had to pay another 50 pence. I beg your pardon, said Paddington. He bent forward and tried to rub the stain with his other paw. Several bun crumbs and a smear of jam added themselves mysteriously to the taxi driver's coat. The driver gave Paddington a long, hard look. Paddington raised his hat and the driver slammed the window shut again. Oh dear, said Mr. Mrs. Brown. We really shall have to give him a bath as soon as we get indoors. It's getting everywhere. Paddington looked thoughtful. It wasn't so much that he didn't like baths. He really didn't mind being covered with jam and cream. It seemed a bit a pity to wash it all off quite so soon. But before he had time to consider the matter, the taxi stopped and the Browns began to climb out. Paddington picked up his suitcase and followed Judy up the flight of white steps to a big green door. Here was Paddington and Judy standing in front of their door. <laughs> Now you're going to meet Mrs. Bird, said Judy. She looks after us. She's a bit fierce sometimes and grumbles a lot, but she really doesn't mean it. I'm sure you'll like her. Paddington felt his knees begin to tremble. He looked round for Mr. and Mrs. Brown, but they appeared to be having some sort of argument with the taxi driver. Behind the door, he could hear footsteps approaching. I'm sure I shall like her, if you say so, he said, catching sight of his reflection on the brightly polished letterbox. But will she like me? Well, that's the end of chapter one of A Bear Called Paddington. <laughs> we'll continue on tomorrow. I hope you guys are enjoying our new story. Have a great night.